Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really honored to be here. I apologize I was late. But actually, I think it's good that I was late because I had a chance to hear other presenters and it gave me opportunity to link what I'm going to say a little bit with their presentations. And what I heard a lot of it um, resonates with the work with, that we are doing. Uh, as Monica said, I am the, uh, um, I am the coordinator, strategy coordinator of the European Network of Migrant Women. We are a European platform of um, uh, 45 um, organizations at the, at the moment and we are growing. Our headquarters is in Brussels, but we are spread over uh, 20 European states. Um, I think that I want to say special thank you to Monica at this point. <laughs> because Monica decided to support us as a network and I am here in no way to lecture you. I'm not an academic and I don't have a research as such to share with you, but I have something else to share the story of our network, how we came to be, what we're doing, and also ask you some questions. I just realized that I actually have 30 minutes in comparison with all other presenters. It makes me feel really humbled and I don't want to spend it all on myself so I'd like to start with asking you some questions because I also want to know with whom I'm speaking. So first, if you could please raise your hands, those of you who are doing academic research. Okay. Um, and uh, those who are engaged at the policy level, with that those who take your research somehow to the policy makers. Um, and how many of you work directly with women? And the last question, how many of you are feminists? <laughs> okay, this is a very good start, I think. It was a warm-up exercise. Now, <laughs> exercise number two. Since so many of you are academics, I'm going to read something for you. Uh, I mean, I don't want to pressurize you, and it's not a test. But if anybody can tell me, who do you think the author of this quote is? With the defeat of the hu humanist philosophies and egalitarian policies of ancient women, the new male god started what is known in history as the slave patriarchal system, based on discrimination between people. It believed in one male sky god and his male prophets from Moses to Christ to Mohammed and all other prophets in all religions, West and East. Capitalism, patriarchy and religion work together for their unholy mutual material interests against justice and equality between people in any country. The right of women and the poor are violated by the capitalist patriarchal system under Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, and other religions. No? Okay, it's Nawal al Sadawi, the extremely famous Egyptian feminist. She's a radical feminist, not just a feminist. So uh, the reason I, I, I chose this quote, and there are so many others that I could choose, is because of the title of my uh, presentation, which is called Radical Sisterhood. And I'm going to bring it home, uh, hopefully, through my speech. I don't have any slides. So I want to tell you something about our network. As I said, we're, we're relatively young. We're we were uh, established, formalized in 2012 with headquarters in Brussels, so we were formalized under the Belgian law, which is extremely complicated, and at some point we even thought to reincorporate in the UK, as before the whole Brexit thing happened. So um, we work with, at, at several levels. Our main level of work at the time when the network was established was the work with the European institutions. So that means that we try to go to those extremely complicated European machinery and communicate with them in order to challenge the laws that are relevant specifically to migrant and refugee women. And migrant and refugee women sit at the intersection of several policy areas. So one would be 
women's rights, the other would be rights of ethnic minorities or migrants. Um, and in reality, they always fall in between. And this is why the network was created, because there were migrant women organizations um, who were meeting in different platforms, forums, uh, maybe participated in joint events, but they didn't feel there was enough political platform for them to articulate what they thought was important. The issues were getting lost on the anti-racist agenda, which is heavily dominated by men, and the issues was, were getting lost in the agenda of the general feminist movement that was primarily excluding the women of color or ethnic minorities and, and so on. So the women got together and they organized the platform and I was a member in this, but I'm, I, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm from Russia. Um, I was born in St. Petersburg and I, I'm, I'm a migrant for the last uh, 17 years. Uh, I, I live in Scotland only for the last two years and that's for personal reasons. Um, so uh, the, the, net, the network was established and um, the, the members started working together in order to address the, the European law. At that time, it was before the, what is called the refugee crisis, so there was a, still some hope that we could change something uh, with European institutions. We practically lost this hope at this point because the situation is so, so bad, really, at, at different levels. There are, of course, some individual pockets of resistance and nice people and uh, those who are trying to effect structural change, but uh, the progress is so incremental that it's impossible even to document it. And if you really take a big scale, we regressed in the European Union at all levels, at women's rights, gender pay gap, violence against women, uh, not to mention the women of ethnic minorities. And then, of course, we have a separate category of women who are the refugee women that our colleague from Portugal all, all, all mentioned, who are in a specifically um, devastating situations because they are physically locked in the spaces w with high prevalence of violence against women, particularly sexual violence, where women are afraid to go to the bathroom because they fear to be raped. Um, so. Uh, from this kind of very grand level of policy work, when we were just trying to be pragmatic and we thought how much we can do sitting there in Brussels, literally, to be honest, being in Brussels you need to have like a lobbying machinery of 20 people who will be just doing lobbying all the time and then maybe you will manage to do something. So we, we shifted our focus to the middle level, which is the level of our members. And it's the migrant women organizations, most of our members are grassroots members, they work directly with migrant women. Um, a lot of the members are dealing with uh, violence against women. And I want to really put it in the center of the discussion because violence against women uh, is, is, is per affects all levels of society so profoundly and it is so connected with economic empowerment or women in STEM because if you're battered at home there's no way you're going to do your STEM when, when your husband doesn't want you to go out. Uh, so, wh whatever other areas our members are dealing with, there is always intersectional violence against women. They are women from different backgrounds. Um, so, for example, our chair, she's a um, um, Kenyan woman and she's the founder of two human rights organizations in Ireland. Um, other women are refugee women from Kurdistan and um, um, the, the women from Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and every one of them carries their work um, in the way they can, considering very uh, harsh political context, depending where the members are. So, yeah, in Ireland it's still a little bit okay, but then we have members in Poland, and we know what's happening at the moment uh, in, in Poland, where there is completely shrinked, or Hungary, uh, completely shrinked civil space, at attack, literal physical attack on, on, on women, um, their computers being taken away from their offices, their raids. So, I, you know, when I'm listening to other presenters from other regions, uh, I really like want to cry and say that it's not so much better in Europe. On so many levels, the situation is really, really bad. It's just Europe manages to preserve the face. And yes, there is a framework, uh, legislative framework, that that makes us kind of hopeful that maybe we can regain our rights. But at the moment, there is a very serious attack on on all fronts. 
Um, so since the moment that the network was established, we carried out several projects with the most recent one uh, that we did together with the um, Women Refugee Commission and European Women's Lobby. Uh, it was the assessment of risks um, faced by the refugee women in uh, the mo mostly the countries that are bearing the brunt of the refugee crisis uh, and also those countries that are receiving a lot of refugees after the relocations. Of course, it will be Sweden and Germany. Um, and uh, the, the um, uh, re situation based on our assessment was very homogeneous across different uh, regions that uh, women are starting from the asylum applications which are not considered as grounds for asylum as gender-based violence generally even though so we have the uh, refugee convention and then we have CEDO and then we have special protocols and guidelines for the convention. Refugee convention is completely gender blind. It was written at the time when they didn't really think about women's rights. Um, but there are other instruments that are supposed to be transposed on the refugee convention that, that you know, uh, those officers, migration, I, d I don't know how, how they're called, who are evaluating the asylum cases, they're supposed to be looking at gender-specific violence and risks that women are facing, because of course also women are not disclosing victims of female genital mutilations, I'm not going to walk through the office and say, hey, you know, they, they cut half of my vagina, this is just not going to happen. Um, so from the fact that women are interviewed uh, in presence of their children when they're never going to speak about the violence faced by their husbands at home um, to the fact that approximately 80% uh, of women who are right now migrating uh, from sub-Saharan region, they are raped. Uh, and rape is used as an instrument of control and domination and the situation in, Sy uh, in, uh, in Libya at this point when um, the detention centers are functioning as official uh, slave uh, markets. So uh, the mm, kind of, you know, the journey of a woman uh, who tries to escape violence in various form, the common understanding that this is violence perpetuated by the state. So there is this bad guy in Syria who is going to torture you. Everything else somehow doesn't count. Where in our experience, really the crisis that we are witnessing now in many ways is a, uh, has a strong feminist drive because a lot of women actively choose a different form of life. They choose to be empowered, they choose to have access to their rights, they choose to save their daughters from forced marriages to which they know that they will be subjected. Um, so it, it's uh, w women are kind of driving this, this um, movement of people and as already was pointed in statistics it's not really reflected so, so as a matter of fact we at the UN level do not have comprehensive data uh, when it comes to mm, for example all the girls who are below 18 they are categorized as children so it's children and migration and, and they have this hashtag and they're very proud of it, it's called children are children and for us it's like no it's a gender blind approach to children because those whom you call children are actually being raped in the camp and they're coming pregnant to our members they're not children, they're young females and there is of course um, the whole concept of girl child that was developed specifically to address um, the, the, to kind of prevent the gender based risk to which girls are subjected because we know that there are no traffickers who are going to sit and wait until you turn 18 and domestic violence and forced marriage starts at a very young age. So this is a very grave picture <laughs> um, and I think it's important to have it in, 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 in mind but I also want to say that the women in our network um, they are just pretty amazing I think because I, I, I work with these women every day and, and some of them uh, went through well, this is an example of our chair. Maybe she's a little bit an exception, but uh, uh, this is the strength of a woman who is a black woman who went from going around the streets of Dublin and, and finding black women and asking them in the street, do you feel the same? Do you also feel invisible like me? Do you also uh, discriminate at home? Getting them at the grassroots level, having the consciousness raising groups uh, and then growing to the position of being the vice chair of uh, Irish Women Council where they invited her for, for her achievements. Um, other <coughs> members 
like I remember in Greece, for example, where we had the AGM last, uh, last summer, uh, they work directly with the refugee women. I do not know if maybe you're from their Melissa network, they're in Athens. Uh, they work mostly with the Leniko camp. Um, it's kind of the, the, the well-managed camp. Eleniko. Yeah, Eleniko. But Eleniko is a very uh, recent camp, legal recent Yes, 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 the biggest one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, there are not a lot of Afghan women, but they also have a lot of Syrians yeah. now. Yeah, and then also women from Eritrea. Yeah. Um, it was interesting the presentation that you were uh, doing because we we visited the camp, uh, this camp la la last summer. Kind of, we went there with a political mission, and this is what I also want to emphasize as a as a platform. Uh, we are we are a political platform. We are a feminist platform, and we are a secular platform. The reason that I, I quoted this um, uh, Nawal al Sadawi to you is because we really do, as a network, we incorporate various women. We have women, women from Philippines who are very, very Catholic women, and for them their Catholic rituals are very important, but bear in mind they're all pro-abortion. And then we have um, women coming from sub-Saharan Africa, and then we have Latin American women who can be also quite religious. So we're a multi-religious network, but religion is treated as a private matter. And there is also a clear realization that religion carries a lot of patriarchal violence with it, and traditionally it was used against women, so we're in no way afraid to criticize this institution. Uh, uh, and again, you know, saying that we're trying to build this sisterhood, uh, we try to recognize that no matter who we are and where we come from and uh, our skin color and our background, we ultimately oppressed as women. We're oppressed at home, we're oppressed by individual men. It's not some abstract structure over there. Every woman has personal experience of sexual harassment or sexual violence or domestic violence. We know that one in three women in Europe uh, this is a statistics, they experience uh, some kind of form of sexual violence throughout their lifetime and I think it's a very kind of mild statistics. So we, we work with this understanding that as women we share and we have a common basis and common understanding. And then of course on top of this we, have, we deal with intersectional feminism and we uh, analyze our intersecting oppressions that are various and many. But uh, the, the main drive for us is the solidarity. And this is what I also feel since so many of you are academics here and I'm following to some extent academic research. I once considered having a career in academia. I don't think academics, academia would survive me or I would not survive <laughs> academia. Uh, either one or another, but I, and I appreciate the importance of academic research. For us to go to policymakers, you know, I need to bring numbers and, and, and figures and speak to them, even though fundamentally I disagree because there is this argument now, oh, we need to prove everything is good for economics, so we somehow supposed to make women's rights fancy and sexy and, and profitable. That's just not the case, human rights are not profitable. And, and yes, it's nice to make this argument, but if, if that's the only argument that makes us win, we're actually losing in the long term. So, um, the, yeah, it's the issue of this solidarity that we try to build and, and um, using the academic research, you know, my message to you, um, if I may, is that those who can um, try to really think long term what is done with your research. Whether it's put on, on, on the shelf, whether it's a matter of research for the sake of research, or whether you can apply it somehow, or distribute or make, make it. And I understand that that's a lot to ask for somebody who is pursuing just academic career. But at the same time, I think it's important um, to have it in mind because what we experience is that there is a very big gap between academic research and, and practical implementation. And for us, it's the, the, the most important because in the end of the day, we work for real women. I don't know how much time did I take, is it? Oh, 15 minutes only. 
I am very happy rather than I, I'm really not used to this format where well, we do the circles and I'm very happy to, ask, to answer questions if you have any if you don't I, I can I can continue because I have a lot to say about the, the network because a lot of you were nodding but maybe you want to say something as well so yes okay I'll explain to you First of all, we as a, as a network, we don't do any practical work. We're a member organization. So it's our members who carry. At, what we do at a network level, we do intra-network projects. We try to, uh, we do internal mentoring, skill exchange, a lot of capacity building kind of exercises for women who are the migrant women leaders. Um, um, you know, they run their own organizations. Uh, the member that we have in Greece, they work in the camp, but they work to a limited extent, and I explain why. They thought and they tried to work with women in, um, you know, coming directly to this, what they call safe spaces or women's centers, and normally they're run by big organizations like this um, International Rescue Committee uh, or some UN agencies. And what happens very often that the women in the camps uh, in those so-called safe spaces, they actually do not feel safe. First of all, when the perpetrator is next door, if you just, you know, around the corner from him, you're not going to speak about your experience. You don't feel that it's a long term. And also very important that, and it's a point that, point that you raised, a lot of the volunteering activities, they have, the, I mean, the ne negative side of it is that there is a constant turnover of people and the trust building is so fundamental for women. It, it really takes well, at least weeks to build this connection and women start opening up. Very often they do not all open up directly. A lot of things are done through some mm, therapeutic art or, or theater. Uh, you know, like we discover cases that there is a five-year-old girl who is being raped and, and uh, how does it come out? It comes out through the drawing of her older sister and not even the mother. Because for mother, it was a horrible um, or shame to, to, to disclose this. Um, and um, what we observed with the women who come to Melissa Network, uh, they are happy to travel through the city. They're happy to get away from the Nobody wants to sit in the cup. It's a bloody prison. So they, they, they get out. They stay there, they enroll, let's say, two, three times a week. And it also, apart from anything else, you know, it's an exercise for their orientation, getting to know the city, learn the language, meet the local people, and so on. And then, of course, it's a matter of space, what you can offer. It's very limited what you can do in the camp. So they have their facility, they have, you know, a relaxation room, there is a common kitchen. A lot of women come just to take shower and, you know, be clean. Um, so yes, not so much work uh, because we, we at some point considered helping them fundraising to, to replicate their model in some other camps that are more rem remote and then we just dropped because we realized that the quality of service will be compromised so much that it's simply not worth it. <laughs>